Well, hey, everybody. My name is Elliot. My wife, Tiffany, and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Let's give it up for all of our first-time visitors today. Everybody online. Come on, let's give it up for our online family, too. I know a lot of people every single weekend are joining us online. That's really special to me. Um, We have a mission here at the church. You can say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline by leading people and becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. If that's a new statement to you, don't worry. Like we say it every week, so it'll just become memorized really soon. You'll get it. Um, Now is a great time to take out your your phones with the YouVersion Bible app on it, or if you got a bulletin as you were handed in, great time to take that out because we're going to take a few notes today. We're going to study the Bible together. We're going to learn a few things about what the Bible has to say Um, especially about legacy, especially about the next generation. Man, how do I even begin a conversation like this? This is the start of a brand new series today called Legacy. And it's it's a series that we do pretty regularly. Maybe you've heard this before, at least once a year, um, we do Legacy. Sometimes we call it something different, but but this year I was really impacted um, that this is not only a message about generosity, and financial stewardship and like what we can do together that we couldn't do separately, but especially how it impacts the next generation. Is anybody else excited about making a difference in the next generation like I am, man? It has like been like haunting me <laughs> in a good way, haunting me that, man, this is, our, this is our responsibility. This is who we're called to be, that we can make a difference in the lives of others, especially kids. I was just told a story this last week um, on Sunday, a family came and they've been coming for a long time and they, and they told me this story. Um, the dad comes up to me and says, hey, you know, before Lifeline Church, we never went to a church before. We, we, we never went regularly to a church before Lifeline. Um, and he tells me, this is, this is how it happened. My wife and my girls, they came without me one day. And when the girls came home, they're teenagers, when they came home, they said, dad, we're, we're going back to that church. We're going back to that church. This is, this is the church we want. This is the kids are saying this to the parents. We want to we wanna come here. And at that point, the dad was like, what, what? And the dad was like, all right, well, this is serious now. This is serious now. And he wasn't against coming to church. He just never had heard his kids so excited about church before. What I would like to propose to you is like, what if we, and that was like incidental. That was like accidental. That was like, we just do a good job with kids because we love them. But what if we actually focused for a season? and really leaned in and made our kids ministries here and what we're doing for the next generation like the most important thing that we do. How, how much of a difference do you think we could make together that we could never do alone? If we came together as a church to say, kids, it's all about you around here. It's all about you around here. You're the next pastors. You're the next worship leaders. Okay, here we go. Got a whole message today and I'm going to get through it, I promise. <laughs> Okay. All right. I'm going to show you how in this series. So that, that's what this series is going to be about. And I'm, I'm, I'm equally as fired up every single week. I got something very specific planned for us to kind of unfold this. This is not just a one month series. This is like a season for us. This is going to be a season for us. But before we jump into all that, I want to uh, let you know about a couple things. Number one is this Wednesday coming up is actually first Wednesday, as we call it. And that means we got a special guest preacher coming in. And this time we got Mark Meyer preaching this time. Pastor Mark, come on, somebody. Let's get excited. This is like, okay, Pastor Mark, you know, he's been here since forever. And he, I, I'm convinced he could run for mayor of Lodi. I'm convinced. <laughs> Or Lockford, I guess, but like Lodi, it's all the same. It's all the same. But seriously, you don't want to miss this. This guy's got an amazing testimony, an amazing story. And I just know anybody that you bring with you, any, any friends, family, whatever, they're going to really be blessed by him. This guy is the most down-to-earth pastor, shepherd uh, that, I've, that I've ever met. And there's no one else like him. I mean that, dude. Um, so that's this Wednesday. Get really excited for that. The next uh, announcement I have for you is Growth Track is next week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, I mean, yeah, that's really cool. I'm going to show you why throughout the rest of this message today, why that's really important. And we actually usually do Growth Track on the first Sunday of every month, but we actually postponed it because it's really important for me to teach you what I want to teach you today about how Growth Track is the on-ramp into the way that we can give our, our, our time and our talents to God in such an appropriate, biblical, and godly way. It's going to be really important, so just hang in there for that. So as we begin, the heart behind legacy, the heart behind giving, generosity, legacy, it's all about the attitude 
It's all about the motivation. It's knowing and believing that we give because he gave first. God gave to us or he gave us our whole life. And so it's an overflow about that. Everything we ever had came from him. So we do exactly what he tells us to do regarding finances, generosity, and serving. And so speaking of generosity, I just want to take a moment. Thank you all, church. Last week was Pastor Appreciation. And uh, I'm just saying, you guys really knocked our socks off. It was amazing. Give it up for yourselves. You are like an honoring church. I want to thank you for all of the cookies, brownies, Cupcakes, chili, pastries. Yes, yes, church, thank you so much. Thanks to you, I am now at risk for type 2 diabetes. And all of my health goals are kind of out the window, but it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. But for next year's pastor appreciation, I'm going to be asking for, um, what do you call those things? They're called like a, they're, they're called like a, a glucose monitor. That's what I need. That's really what I need next year. Because you guys really bless me so much that I, I can't really even eat it all. No joke. I, I, I'm like, kind of a fanatic about my health and stuff. So I have my oatmeal every single morning and I had so many things from you guys. I was breaking up brownies and putting them in the oatmeal. <laughs> I'm breaking up chocolate chip cookies, putting them in there. This is not a lie. I was absolutely doing that. And I'm not going to tell you how much weight I gained this last week because it's none of your business. Okay. It's none of your business. <laughs> All right. You know, that's between me and the Lord. And I'm also still a little hungover from Halloween, but that's okay. Candy. <laughs> Candy. I know I have to clarify that with Lifeline sometimes. It's like candy hungover, okay? All right. So when it comes to giving, let's, let's talk about giving a little bit. Uh, this, can be a, this can be a fun one to talk about, but I've never really faced that. Um, I, I, every, every time I've taught about giving, even tithing, even stuff like that, I'm usually met with a lot of receptive hearts, usually. And so I know that some places, sometimes some people like struggle with that, but I've never really actually encountered that. But it's... When it comes to giving, it's not about just a bill that you pay to prove to the world how generous you are. That's not what it's about at all. Um, it's not like holy membership dues <laughs> to belong to a place. It's not about that. You know, I got to pay my tithe. That's what people say. They say I have to pay my tithe in order to like belong somewhere. It's not about that at all. Just to be seen as like good enough. Of course, it's not about that. But some people actually do think that. Like they wouldn't say it, but they think it. They feel it like because it's. I believe it's from bad teaching that maybe they've seen somewhere, heard somewhere, taught about it in the wrong way. Because I've got every right, you know, as a pastor, as a preacher, as someone who studies the word, I've got every right to say, well, this is just the right thing to do. Y'all, so just do it. I could say that, and that would be all true. But I think we do each other. So, because I'm not the only one talking about money. Y'all talk about money too. So I, we do each other a disservice when we talk about money that way. When we talk about, man, you just got to do it. I mean, imagine if we told people to, to serve in the kids' classrooms because you need to. Okay, well, I guess that's true. We, we should be serving, but shouldn't it come from a different place in our heart? Yes. Isn't that when it's the most impactful is when it comes from the overflow of gratitude? So why is money any different? And that's what I want to talk to you about today is a heart of gratitude. That's the name of this message is a heart of gratitude. Because people are thinking and, and rationalizing that, you know, I, I can't do this. I can't do all that. You know, I'll do it when I get a raise. I'll do it when, I, when things change. I'll give later. You know, when I win the lottery. I've experienced people that said that, that literally won the lottery. Or they got an inheritance or something like that. I am not kidding. It does not matter whether you win the lottery or whether you get that inheritance. Where you, what you believe and how you kind of feel about that right now is exactly how you will respond when that day comes. It is rationalizing and it's, because I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes. They're like, oh yeah. When that happens, when things are different, then I'll do it. And then they literally get a windfall and they're like, oh, well, you know, see what had happened was, you know, I can't do it right now. Well, oh, you know, it just, just so happens that I don't like you anymore. So I'm gonna go over here where they don't know that I said that. It's crazy to me. But it's, what it comes from is deep down, we're kind of like, we're struggling with it. We're struggling with it. And that's, that's I mean, I, I just, I love you guys. I love my church. I love you. And I, I don't want you to struggle. I don't need, I don't need from you. I want for you. That's something I've been saying a lot because it's really been on me is I don't want you to struggle with this idea. I want it to come from the right place. And that place is gratitude. Okay, so. It's, it's giving has not been taught right. And I believe that we've gotten away from the real heart of what giving and serving and, and tithing and all that whole thing. Every sacrifice that we make, it's not out of obligation. It's not what it's supposed to be all about. It comes from 
being born again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tease that out because you're like, wait, what? <laughs> I thought I was born again. You are. You are. Maybe you are. But I want to talk about these two things. Are you born or are you born again? Have you been born into the world and you still kind of just live in the way the world lives or are you born again? Let me talk to you about this. Are you born or born again? This is a section in your notes if you're taking notes. We all have a part to play in this, this idea of legacy, making a difference, caring for God's house, God's people, the kids that come here. Oh, you could turn that off. We ain't, we ain't even close. <laughs> we ain't even close to that. But, that's, but thank you for that. I appreciate that. You're like, that's a good point. I'm gonna, let's get some piano on that. Mm, mm, wow. Sounds good right there. <laughs> Are you born or born again? Are you born or born again? We all have a part to play. And, and God's people, all the kids that come here, the expansion of God's kingdom, it's not reserved for some. This is, this is all of us. We're all supposed to be coming together as a church, as a family, as a group to make a big difference. It's for everyone. But the reason why it's a struggle and the, the, the idea I want to unfold for you today is that we are born selfish, but we're born again generous. We're born selfish, but we're born again generous. So let's unpack that. I'm going to break that into two sections, and we're going to unpack this through the Word of God. Number one, we're all born selfish. Everybody, all of us, every single person. I don't have to teach my kids to say, mine. You want to prove this? Just put two toddlers in one room, put a nice shiny toy right between them. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to say, you know what? You first, you first. And maybe, maybe some, but like, at, what I'm trying to say is at our core, like, Babies don't need to be taught to say mine. They figure it out all by themselves, all by themselves. We're born selfish. We're born thinking about ourselves. And this is not something we grow out of. That, rational, that rationalization and the way, that way of thinking just gets more sophisticated. <laughs> so a kid doesn't know how to articulate in a way that makes you think it's right. Like, no, this is my toy. Like my kids try to make it seem like, no, no, I had it first. And you're like, that doesn't matter. Share. But as we get older, we get really creative and good at, well, you know, this is not the right time for me. It shouldn't be about all that. And we get real, real rationalizing on why we shouldn't do these things. Like we're grownups. We know how to convince other grownups what we should and shouldn't do. So we don't grow out of this naturally. We just get more sophisticated about how we defend our self-preservation. We just get more sophisticated at it. There are many scriptures I could have chosen to walk you through today, but one of my favorites is Zacchaeus, the wee little man, Zacchaeus, man. This is a great story if you don't know it. Like if you didn't, if you weren't raised in Sunday school, like I was not raised in Sunday school, maybe you're kind of new to Zacchaeus was a wee little man. He had to get up in the sycamore fig tree and all that stuff. But we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Zacchaeus today and uh, hopefully going to unfold some things that are new, revelatory for you to be able to see. Luke 19 is where the story is. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town and there was a man named Zacchaeus. Love that name, by the way. Come on. Let's give it up for all the unique names out there. Some of you got them, but Elliot is not as unique as I used to think it was. I only know one other person, but Zacchaeus, never have I ever met anybody named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector in the region, and he had become, everyone say it with me, very rich, very rich. And you're like, well, that rules me out. Well, hang on just a second. Hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but was too short to see over the crowd. He ran ahead and climbed over a sycamore fig tree behind, beside the road, and Jesus was going to pass that way. So right now, you might be thinking, story's over, because I'm not very rich. Well, who are you comparing yourself to? Are you comparing yourself to up the street? Because we all have somebody up the street. Like, the neighborhood I live in is not, like, super fancy, but I used to think only rich people lived over there. But then when you move over there, you're not rich anymore. No, no. Now it's that other neighborhood over there. It's all. And then you move over there and you're like, oh, well, you know, I'm not, no, it's the, where does it end? Right? So who are you comparing yourself to? Um, I jotted down some notes and anybody can Google these things, just like Googling uh, how rich are Americans compared to the rest of the world. Go ahead, try it on your own time. It's very illuminating. Um, if you own your own car, you're better off than 88% of the world's population. Only 12% of the world's population owns their own car, and most of us have two. You know what I'm saying? Some of you are like, well, not all of us, Pastor, and I got you, I got you. Well, how about this one? Um, some research, research, wow, I speak good for a living. 
There are some studies that indicate that, <laughs> that if you earn $50,000 in one year, your household is better off than 50%, 50%, or no, excuse me, top 5%. You can Google these on your own. There was too many. Some of them didn't seem real. They were so extreme. And so I left some out because as I was Googling, I was like, I cannot believe that. We are so well off. So I know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to Americans. Well, I'm talking to Californians, okay, where we've got million dollar homes and we're like, well, that's not, that's not a big deal. We say stuff like that. It's like, oh, that's just over there. It's crazy to me, but, and we're like, oh, well, I'm not rich. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's just keep reading then. Then Jesus came by. He looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed, climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were, were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. So Jesus comes to and engages with people who are selfish and sinful. That's good news for all of us. Okay, good news. But the story doesn't end there. Going over to verse eight. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I've cheated anyone on their taxes, which he had, I will give them back four times as much. That's a lot. And then Jesus says this, and this is where it gets really crazy. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. In response to what Zacchaeus said right there, Jesus said, salvation. That right there, that's being born again. That is salvation. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you saying I need to give to be saved? No. But the indicating factor, the, 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 the indicating factor that Zacchaeus had been born again in that moment, Jesus said, that's what it was. And what was it? It was generosity. It was saying, I don't, I don't you know what? Whatever, half of it. Four times as much, like I'll pay anybody back. That's crazy. That's crazy. Zacchaeus gives half his wealth and Jesus says, salvation come to this house because he has shown that he has freely received by freely giving in equal proportion to what he had. Which one of us doesn't have anything? We all have something. And God sees us when we give in proportion to what we have. So in other words, number two, we're born again, generous. When we're born again, we're born again, letting go of the selfishness, letting go of the uh, self-preservation of the, uh, I need to get ahead and keep up with the Joneses. <laughs> Love that. My last name's Jones. You're like, what are you talking about? My last name's Jones. It's funny. It's really funny. Really funny, actually. We're born again, generous. And this is not a one-off story. This happens over and over again. This is a consistent theme in scripture. In fact, the disciples and the whole church in the book of Acts, once, once everybody was getting saved, all they were doing was bringing, bringing their resources to, to God. They were selling everything they had, bringing them to the disciples. This is a consistent theme in scripture. We've got the, the woman with the alabaster jar that gave a year's wedge. She did all of that. Um, and it, it happened so much that there was, a, there was a couple in Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira. They pretended to bring all their wealth just to fit in because everybody was doing it. It's a crazy story, by the way. Go read Acts 5 and think, <laughs> let that impact you, okay? I'm not going to preach on that today, though, because <laughs> it's, a, it's a wild one. But that's crazy to me. The Ananias and Sapphira, they, they brought, you know, a portion of what they had, but they, they claimed it was everything because everybody was doing it. They were doing that just to fit in. It's undisputed that when people get the Spirit of God in them, they get real givey. They just do. People get real givey when the spirit of God fills them up and fills them to overflowing and they realize I've been born again. Oh my God, I'm saved. What, what do you need? Like you need my jacket, you need my shoes, you need my what, like whatever it is. Like I'm just ready to give it up because I, I can see, oh gosh, it's powerful. Practically speaking, we all have a part to play in this. Caring for God's house, caring for God's people. The expansion of the kingdom is not reserved for some. It's for all of us, church. It's for all of us. We all ought to be doing this because we're born, we're all born selfish. And among everybody here, I think I might've been the worst. I might've been the worst. I was selfish out the, out the wazoo. I was crazy about it. I was all about my own life. I know what this feels like to get born again and go, everything I have came from him. So what do you need, kingdom? What do you need, king? I'll give you everything. And that's where we need to live. That's what we need to see. It's because of the gratitude of being saved. It's because of the gratitude of being over filled with with gratefulness 
That's why we give. But what can we do about it? And it's a struggle for some people. I know it is. So what can we do about it? If it is a struggle, I don't want to just leave you there and be like, yeah, you ought to be doing it if you're born again. And you're like, help me then because I'm struggling with it. I want to help you. I want to help you with that. I want to, I want to teach you how to have a heart of gratitude today because it's something that can be taught. It's not you're like, oh, well, I don't feel it, so I'm not going to do it. No, 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 no. There is a way to cultivate a heart of gratitude. It's actually very simple. It's actually very simple. Number one, you can count your blessings. You ever heard that one? Raise your hand if you've heard that statement. Count your blessings. This is from scripture. I didn't know it was from scripture, um, but uh, I heard it before I got saved. I heard it before, um, you know, I got into all of this. I started studying the Bible and all that, but it comes from Philippians 4, 8 says this, and now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. He says this, think, everyone say think. Think, that's an important word in this passage. Think about such things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Because Paul uses a word, I had to like spell it out. Logizomai, logizomai. The word think, I know, don't worry about it. It's fine. We don't speak Greek. We don't have to. It's great. Think, logizomai, logizomai. And and maybe in your Bible, it's translated um, think, dwell, or meditate. But it means to count or make an account of. Another way to say it would be take inventory. Take inventory. That's one I'm familiar with. (laughs) I got to keep it anonymous though, you know. I got like three laughs on that. So I see you now. (laughs) I'm like, I know what meetings you've been to. (laughs) Gotcha. It's all right. I've been there too. So it's okay. Think about these things. And so take inventory of the good things. That's what Paul is telling us. Like writing it down. Like to actually take inventory. To actually count them. Count your blessings. So that little phrase that maybe you grew up hearing that we're supposed to count our blessings. That's very, very truly what Paul is telling us to do. You you should count them. What does that do? Because it helps us to cultivate a heart of gratitude. Helps us to see how much we really have to be thankful for. Count your blessings. Like that little Googling exercise I told you, go go Google how rich Americans are compared. It'll help you see, man, not only do I have a car, my car has its own house. Wow called a garage, everybody. It's a garage. But like things like that, where you can just go, wow, I guess I am really blessed, aren't I? Um, (laughs) My mom, I heard this phrase first from my mom and I wasn't raised in church. I always say that. And my mom watches online and she's always like mortified when I say that. (laughs) She's very embarrassed now. But uh, my mom is like a Disney princess singing to birds. That's who my mom reminds me of. She's like any (laughs) Disney movie you've seen where the princess is like sewing her own dress and singing to the birds. That's what my mom is like. She's like perfect. I have a perfect mom. All the other moms just keep trying. But my mom, she's the best. (laughs) And I say that because she would sing about everything. She would sing about everything. She would sing about doing the dishes. She'd be singing, ha, oh, dishes, ha, oh. Doing the laundry, she'd be singing, oh, I'm gonna fold these laundries right here. But she would sing, I'm not kidding at all. Mom, please comment, say it's true. I'm dying up here. But she would sing this other little jingle, count your blessings, name them one by one. Oh. I know it's weird, but she would do it. I had to suffer through it. So do you (laughs) count your blessings. See what God has done. You ever heard that one? All right. I got a few. That's good. She used to sing that. Wasn't raised in church, but I was being taught biblical principles right there. And it helped me remember. And that's what I want for you. I want you to remember to do this. Count your blessings. See, like, look at all the good things God has done for you. Look at the fact that you got your family right here. And if you don't got a family, you probably got a place to stay. And if you don't got a place to stay, you probably got some transportation. If you don't got transportation, you probably got somebody who's giving you food. If you don't got someone giving you, like our homeless live pretty well. I could preach the same message to a homeless man. I'm not kidding at all. I mean, we, they got clothes, they got meals coming every single, like even just living around here, no matter if you don't have a place to live, you could be doing this. It applies to all of us. We all have something to give. We all have something to give. So if it helps you to remember, remember the little jingle. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. And then once you do that, what's that going to remind you to do? It's going to help you remember to be like Zacchaeus. I want you to be like Zacchaeus. That's number two here. Be like Zacchaeus. 
And I don't mean you got to shorten yourself down. You don't have to be a wee little man and you don't have to be wicked either. <laughs> you don't have, not the sinful part. Okay, guys, not the sinful part, the, the born again part, the generous part. God's goodness that didn't simply turn him from something. And some people think that you, when you get saved, it just turns you from your sin. And that's true. But what are you turning to when you get born again? You know, you're, you're turning from a life. We repent and we're called to repent and turn from our life, our old life. But what are, you, what are we turning to? Zacchaeus teaches us that we, we should be turning to a life of generosity, a life of, of giving, a life of living outside of your own needs and wants and desires and giving towards others because something happened in him that I want to happen in me. That where he wasn't concerned with what his bank account looked like in that moment, when he was face to face with Jesus and Jesus showed him, I love you right where you're at, changed him, changed him. And he said, it's not about all that anymore. It's not all about all my, all my wins. It's not about all my victories. It's not about all my possessions. It's not about, you know, getting to that upper level of retirement, whatever, all of that stuff. Not that he didn't have it. Even after he gave half of his wealth away, he was probably still better off than a lot of people he was next to. But for him, this was powerful. And for all of us as Americans, like we're, we're way more like Zacchaeus than we like to think, but on the, on the self-preservation side. And I want all of us to start thinking like, what, I want to be more like Zacchaeus on the generous side. Jesus said he showed what was in his heart by his generosity. God's goodness didn't simply turn him from something, it turned him to something. Romans 2, chap, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. Paul said this, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Well, Zacchaeus was turned from his sin to generosity. His kindness is intended to turn us from our sin, yes, and turn us towards giving which is financial on one side, but it's also much more than that. We talk about giving in three ways, treasure, but also time and talent. It's these little three T's, you know, and everybody loves talking about time and talent because it's free <laughs> to give those away. But it's all, it's all three. But I want to talk about those two because those two are really important. Your time and your talent. We call that serving around here. Just serving, just serving. So that's, that's, why I, that's why I was excited about Growth Track. Y'all were like, Growth Track, cool, 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 cool. But Growth Track for us, this is our way of, of showing every single person that is wanting to belong to a church, that's wanting to be a part of a church, that's wanting to join the dream team, that's, that's wanting to just like get closer to God in a church family. We're showing people in Growth Track every single month, man, this is what it means to like lean into God's design for you and turn around and and find that, but also give it away with your time and your talent, your time and your talent. And, and for many of you, this is your next step. This is your next step. Like this is exactly where you're at. This is your next step. Some of you are so good with kids. I'm just thinking about kids a lot. I already told you, I'm thinking about kids and what's going on in those classrooms next door and, and how, much, how much it means to them. And not just because I have kids in there, but you do too. And those kids are learning right now. Like Miss Rachel was talking about, man, these kids are like, they're learning the Bible. They're learning what it means to live a godly lifestyle. They're learning that right there. And so many of us, we didn't have that. It just like accidentally came and went or, you know, the church experience was bad. And so the parents pulled out of all that. But I dare I say, we got a good church here. This is a good thing that we've got going on here, everybody. It's good. It's good. So why wouldn't we want to think about giving to the, to the kids and and make, some of you are so good at this too. You're so good at making kids feel cared for. Like just your presence. I'm not saying you're like a school teacher. I'm saying like just you being with them, smiling. You can make them laugh. Some of you are very gifted at this. And I want to just remind you, man, there, those, there's kids over there waiting for you. They, they need you, dare I say. They need you over there. And we don't come from a place of need. We never, ever talk like, oh, come on, please. Please serve in the classroom. No, you get to. You get to see the light come on. You get to see those kids begin to, to get it and, and to understand. And you're the one that gets to be a part of that. It's amazing. Because we have a really good team over there already. I'm just asking you to consider joining the already great team that already exists over there because nothing says legacy like investing your time and talent in the next generation. Nothing. 
Nothing says legacy like that. So growth track is next week. And I'm telling you, this is some of your next step is to just go in there and say, all right, well, time and talent. I want to be like Zacchaeus. I want to serve. I want to give, you know, and I'm not asking you to really take on some heavy burden. I actually got with the team this week and was asking like, what's the entry level? Like, what's the first level? You know what it is? It's one service. So like we have two services every Sunday. It's one service every three weeks. It's not like some heavy burden. (laughs) It's very like, we got a good team, but I just want us to start thinking about it and like going, it's not like what happens over there. No, this is all of us. If we can all understand and get this and and go into growth track and go, you know what? Put me in coach because I got, I know I have something to give. I want you to see that you really do. You are blessed. And you, some of you have the absolute ability to give to God through your time and talent by investing in those kids with us. But that's only one side of the equation. I would be remiss not to talk about the other side because some of you, you're you're giving, like your financial giving is really incredible, um, but your serving is kind of sparse. Got quiet in here. Others of you, your tithe is nothing to brag about. You know, your 10%, tithe just means 10%. That is not, not really anything to brag about, but the way that you give, the way you bless those kids and your serving is unmatched. Now, listen to me really closely. Everyone is called to both. I, I'm not asking you to choose one or the other, but I am saying we give in proportion. We give in proportion to what we have. And some of us are financially blessed, like even more so than the person next to you. And some of us are, are blessed with talents and abilities and time to be able to do some really incredible things. But we're all called to both. We're all called to both. So don't hear me wrong, but I am going to talk about the two differently, but in the same way. And it's number three. I want you to get this. I want you to give what you've received. Isn't that sound, doesn't that sound fair? <laughs> give based on what you've received. Not, not the person next to you, because we all have a tendency to look at the person next to us or look up the street at rich people and say, well, I can't give like that, so I might as well not. Or we look at Miss Rachel, who like owns the classrooms and she's so good. And we're like, well, I'm not like all that. So I, I shouldn't even worry about that. No, 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 no. Don't compare yourself to others. Just, just, just look at your own life. Take inventory of your own self and say, okay, what can I do in the area of finances? And what can I do in the area of serving? Give based on what you've received. You can't give what you don't have, and God doesn't ask you to. You can't give what you don't have, and God doesn't ask you to. So a business person, for example, may not serve as frequently because they're working six and a half days a week, which I would recommend against. (laughs) Everyone needs a Sabbath, but business people, you know. I I know you, and I know who you are, and I know that you're out there, and you're gifted in doing business and and helping the economy and and employing all all these guys, and that's great. So a business person may not serve as frequently, even though they should still do something, but maybe not as frequently, but when it's time to build a new classroom, they'll be there. Okay, so that's for one person though. What about someone else who who still gives, but their serving is what's really moving the needle, like really moving the needle. And again, I'm not telling you to pick one. I'm just telling you to give based on what God has blessed you with. Even the word tithe, uh, the word tithe is, it just means 10. It means 10th part. It's a percentage. You know what that means? That means one person's tithe and another person's tithe could be extremely different and both totally God-pleasing because it's based on what you have, not based on what the next person has. It's fair that way. And serving is the same way. I'm not going to ask the same thing of a business person as I am from a single mother who's trying to do it all by herself. Well, you need to get in there and serve every week. No, you don't need to do that. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to speak to them differently based on where they're at in life and, and what they're going through. And luckily there is a standard financially. There's something to look for. And in serving, it's actually a little bit more, it's harder to figure out, but it's, it's important for us to think it through. What can I do? What can I do? Okay. Let's talk about this. Matthew 10, heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, cast out demons. Okay. Give as freely as you have received. Over and over again in the Bible, it talks about this. But my favorite story, oh, my favorite story is the woman who got saved and set free and then gave all she had because it encapsulates the heart of gratitude that we're called to have more than any other scripture, I believe. 
I'll, let me read it to you out of Luke 7. Powerful, powerful. Take this in, please. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went into his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet. She wiped them off with her hair. She kept kissing his feet. That's intimate. Kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Notice, she didn't just serve him. And that's what that is. She's serving him, cleaning, wiping, crying, just pouring out time, talent. I'm giving that way. But she also brought her treasure. Like this might have been everything she had. Why would she do that? Like, didn't anybody take her through FPU? <laughs> didn't anybody take her through Dave Ramsey's? Like, she's got to save some. Jesus didn't correct her. Why did she give so much? And Jesus called out why. He says exactly why. And it won't be a surprise. Verse 47, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little only shows a little love. My question to you is, have you been forgiven much? Have you been set free and saved? Then do like the woman did. Show it by doing what she did, giving in proportion, just bringing what she had. She had her tears. She had her hair. She gave her time. She even made herself a, a spectacle. You have to think about that too. Like there was like, it was a shameful act that she kind of did. Wiping someone's feet down. She didn't care about any of that. And she brought her treasure too. Could have been her, could have been her life savings that she brought. I don't know. It doesn't say. So when I talk about giving financially, I know that it can be a struggle for a lot of people. And we like to help people. Um, cause I, I, I could, like I said earlier, I could just tell everybody, you know, just give, give the 10%, just do it. It's tithing. You're supposed to do it. And I could be, I would be right in all of that. And I would be justified in doing it. I have all permission in the world scripturally to do that. But we here at Lifeline, we like, we're, we a little crazy. We're crazy around here, man. And our leaders years ago decided that we were going to not just ask people to go out on the tightrope of giving, but we were going to put down a safety net for people so they could feel like they could take that first step, man. Cause it's, a, it's one thing to say, yeah, I trust God can get me across that tightrope. But it's one thing to step out on it and go ah, without a safety net. So we've created something here called the 90 day challenge. 90 day challenge. Sandy got it in her hand right here. She read, she ready. I love that. And it's in the seat back in front of you. It's been there all along. It's been there as long as you've been coming. It's always there, but we just don't talk about it every week, but it's pertinent right now to talk about. We are wild here at Lifeline. And we're just wild enough because, you know, I, I got saved as an adult and I just read the Bible and said, why do we do this? How come we're not doing that? How come we're not doing this? And there's one place in scripture that I found that there was a place that we can test God. Every other place in scripture says, don't test God. You don't do that. No, 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 no. You don't test God. There's one place in scripture in Malachi 3. It's on the little card right there that you can put God to the test. Put, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts and sit, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and see that I won't pour out a blessing so much there won't be room enough for you to store it because he doesn't want you to store it. He wants you to give it. And so what we did here at Lifeline is we said, why don't we put our money where our mouth is and actually make it a real test? And so we have the 90-day challenge that is essentially, you can try tithing. And after 90 days, if, if, if God doesn't come through for you in some way, I know it's crazy, even as I'm saying it. I'm like, I don't believe we do this, but we do. If he doesn't come through, he doesn't show himself. If God doesn't prove himself true in your act of, of giving and generosity with the, with the tithe, we will return it all to you. Because this is not a, like a financial campaign, like we need to make budget. The budget's good, y'all. We're good. We don't need from you. We want for you to experience the same thing that I experienced personally, that God's never let me down. He's never let me down financially. He's never let me down in a relationship. He's never let me down ever. As long as I do what the song said, everything I need, I know my father has it. My father has it. 
He provides for me. He's always provided for me since the very beginning of my relationship with the Lord. He's given me literally everything I need and the finances are the least of those. He's easily met all my needs financially. I'm not the richest person on my block, but that's not anything. That's not anything. Again, some of your giving might already be great, but your serving is sparse and unspectacular. Others of you, your, your tithe is unimpressive. Your 10% is unimpressive, but the way that you bless those kids in there, you have yet to find out how much of a blessing you're going to make in their life. Everyone is called to do both, not to pick one. Everyone's called to give and serve. But when you give your talent and your treasure in proportion to what you have, we change lives. And that's what legacy is. That's what leaving a legacy means is you give in proportion to what you have and you make a difference because when you bring it with the right heart, with the heart of gratitude, it makes a difference. Oh my goodness. We change lives together. Why? Because we're all born selfish, but we're born again generous in our time, in our talent, and our treasure. Just look at me, for example. Like I, I like to point at me because, hey, I need to be honest first. I need to be the one that's, that's going first, right? And so I like to look, I was just thinking back on my own story in the midst of this context. When I came here, this is the first church I ever came to. This is the first church I ever attended. I was like 22 years old, 23. And when I came here, I was worth very little. You look at me and you're like, ah, come on. No, really, I was worth very little. I'm not just talking financially. Well, that was absolutely true, but I was worth very little in any way. Like I barely, I knew, didn't know how to play guitar. Um, I'm just a recovered drug addict. I'm a felon. I can't even get a good job because all the good jobs were shooting me down because, and they didn't, they didn't trust me. They didn't believe in me, but there was one place I had a lot of value right here. And I was treated like I had a lot of value, like just what I had was enough. This is where we ought to be learning about this stuff is in church that you have value and maybe your story's not like mine. Maybe you do have a lot of value, but we all have that feeling on the inside. Like, Oh, what I bring is not enough. What I have is not enough. Like my serving is not enough. My finance is not enough. But here I learned how to give. Like when I started tithing, I was just waiting tables. I made like $170 in one week, brought my $17, you know, I was worth very little when I started here, but God used that $17. I don't think he used it in the, in the house as much as he used it to change my heart and to show me that every step of the way he was there for me. Every step of the way he kept on bless, blessing me and I never went hungry. And no matter like, even when I started getting new jobs, it like, it all just happened. It all worked out. And even though my tide looks a lot different, my tide looks a lot different than it used to. It's, I've always believed because I started small. And now that I make like a reasonable couple should make, I've, I have this rooted knowledge. My father has me and I can always bring what's right to him because he'll always take care of me. It's big. I also served. Like I said, I barely knew how to play guitar back then, but I just gave my all. I gave my 100%. I served with the youth. Um, because even back then I wasn't the most qualified, but I gave my whole heart to those kids. You know, I was on the youth team. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't good enough to lead anything, but they let me serve on the team. And I actually remember having a conversation with one of the young girls in the, in the youth group out in the parking lot here. And, uh, that was like, I don't know, 15 years ago. It was a long time ago. And we were just at a, 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 a pastor's conference last month. And there she was. She is serving now as a kids and youth pastor. This young girl, Brittany is her name. Brittany Holbert, some of you know her. Yeah, that's right. She's a, she's a pastor now. And she told me, I wasn't asking for it. She, she came to me and told me, hey, Pastor Elliot, I just want to let you know, remind you that that conversation we had that one day when I was struggling with the stuff, that made a real difference in me. And it, it really changed the trajectory of my life. And I, I decided that I could do it. I could go to Bible college. I could give myself. To me, like what I was giving in that moment seemed pretty small. But it wasn't small to her. What might you do for a young person? 
What's one conversation you might have with a young person in one of those classrooms? that they grow up remembering a conversation you had with them, remembering that church is a fun place to come, knowing that church is the place when I go there, I don't wanna leave and it just makes me laugh, it makes me feel good. Like what might you bring that seems small, but will make a huge impact on someone's life? It shocked me for her to say that to me because I, I barely remembered. Even though the world didn't want me, they were shooting me down from jobs and I was a reject and I was a drug addict and I was a felon and they didn't want anything I had. There was one place I had a lot of value, right here. And I wanna tell you, church, you have value right here. You can help those kids. You can bless those kids. You can bring what you have. It doesn't have to be a million dollars. It doesn't have to be you're the next kids, whatever. Just bring what you have. Trust God. He can use that. He'll make a difference in someone's life. He'll bless them. And guess what? You might get blessed too. It's legacy. Legacy. I'm trying to tell you, it feels good to leave a legacy. Not only is it good for them, it's good for us. Church, I'm, I'm, I'm rallying us. Growth track. Next week. Tithe challenge, whenever you're ready. Like just let's get, what can we do together that's gonna make a real difference in the lives of the young people that need us right now? Do you think kids need us right now in this generation? Do you think kids need us, church, to get over ourselves a little bit and to count our blessings and to be a little bit more like Zacchaeus? and give from a place of gratitude and a place of overflow, not out of obligation, out of overflow. Not, be, not because Pastor Elliot said to do it, but because my God has been so good to me. He saved me, he helped me, he brought me into this family, he, 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 he saved me from my addiction, he, he did everything. Let what you bring come from that place. It should start with a heart of gratitude because that's what God did for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And if you would like to receive even just that today, if you're ready to take, let that seed take root in you, that you would receive that God, he forgives sinners. <laughs> he still eats with sinners. He still comes into sinners' houses and gives us a chance to change our heart. If that's you today, and you wanna get woke up to this whole kingdom of God thing, and everything good God wants to do in your life, if that's you, then we're gonna pray. I'd love for all of us though to bow our heads, close our eyes together. Just a little moment of privacy for us today. But I think some of you, this is really, really important. While we're all gonna pray, there are some of you that really, really need this. You needed this message today. You needed to get shook out of the regular, everyday, taking care of self. And we need to just re be reminded of how much God's done for us. And it starts with him sending his son, Jesus, to die on a cross for our sins. So if that's something you wanna walk into today and start a brand new relationship with him today, or maybe you need to come back into relationship with him today, no matter who you are, where you're at in that journey, if that's you, would you lift your hand, please? Because I wanna pray for you right now. Yes and amen, yes and amen, yes, 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 yes. Yes, I see you, I see you. Everyone online here, I, I'm, I'm gonna see you later. But this is important. Because I know some of you, you're saying, I need a restart in this. I need a restart in this whole kingdom of God thing. I've gotten off track. And for some of you, you're brand new. So for everybody here, let's pray this prayer together as a family so that we can know we're not alone in this. God wants to set you free, set your feet on solid ground and bring you right back to where you need to be with a heart of gratitude. So let's pray. Say it with me. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Restore me to a place of gratitude, to a place of thankfulness. Open my eyes to see every good thing that you've done for me and my family. I receive your love. I receive your son 
who forgave my sins. Fill me with your spirit and make me new. Amen.